Um, I, uh oh, <laughs> uh, I used to work in uh, domestic violence and, and sexual violence organization for eight years, and I worked on both sides doing multiple roles. And then I worked for the school system for eight years. And for three weeks, I have been in a hospital as a beacon social worker. So I work with adult survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, human trafficking, including sex trafficking, um, and elder abuse. So this is the new role for me, but I'm kind of going back to my roots. Um, but I have seen all of the populations that I've worked with suffering with cumulative trauma and increases in mental health concerns and substance abuse and different things like that. So I think that it, it just was appealing to me. And I'm very excited to get back into the NC CASA and NCCADV trainings because I loved those so much before and was very fond of them. And I'm, I'm just very happy to be back. Well, we're pretty happy you're back. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. And one more person. Alexis, would you like to say hello? Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, um, so I am actually a military victims advocate. Uh, I'm stationed out in San Diego and uh, I took or started this role this year actually. So it's only been about a couple of months. Um, so for me, it's just kind of about expanding um, my understanding and knowledge um, so that I can tie it into the work that I'm doing uh, at the base where I work. I love that. Thank you. And the the chat has been pretty active too. Deanna, thanks for continuing to connect with people and letting them know about the resources. Okay, let's go to the next slide. The way that I will work with you in this webinar is I will ask you to take the information as I'm presenting it and to work with it. Those of you who are familiar with adult learning theory probably know that adults retain information and can learn more deeply if the information is directly applicable to them. So one of the ways to reinforce that is to have you use the information right as I'm presenting it. So I'd like to start from a place of building on strengths. One of the things we know about cumulative trauma, one of the things we know about all kinds of trauma is that in addition to trauma, people have strengths. And the strengths are what we often need to champion to help people to heal. So to think about that, start with thinking about two strengths you bring to your work, and please write those down, and then two strengths of your team, the team as a whole. And if you don't have a team at the workplace where you are now, th think of a team of people. Perhaps you've worked with a team in the past, perhaps your family, perhaps your community. So individual and collective strengths, that's what we're looking at. So when I think about strengths individually for myself, I think about I'm fairly verbal. 
I like to work with people. I'm, I'm compassionate. I think I bring compassion and bridge building to my work. When I think about strengths of a, of teams that I've been on, um, I can give you a couple of examples. A faculty team that I was on, absolutely one of their strengths was being able to deeply research topics. And so the in, we had plenty of information when we were making decisions. Another strength of the faculty team was um, the ability to collaborate. And they would take information and work together in smaller groups. When I think about a, a, a completely different team, a team of consultants that come together once a month, one of the strengths of that team is commitment, strong commitment to our mission to help nonprofit organizations heal. Another strength of that team is the ability and the willingness to work together. So yes, we collaborate and even more than that, we're very committed to each other's growth. So that willingness of working together is also about helping each other to grow. So that gives you a sense of how strengths can be many and varied. If we could go to the next slide, I'll introduce you to a model. And this is called the Strengths and Shadows model. It was developed by my colleague, Pat Vivian and myself back in 2002. And it's a way to identify patterns, especially collective patterns. We can do this for ourselves looking at teams and even stronger if we can bring people together through Zoom or all together in a room to look at what are our organizational patterns. And we start with strengths. So going to the next slide. Each strength has at least one shadow. And a shadow isn't necessarily the opposite, it's more the fallout. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. And it, it helps us to discover and name patterns. So instead of looking at people and saying, well, you do this and you don't do that, we say, okay, you know what? As a team, this is how we operate. Or as an organization, these are our patterns. And we get to think about those patterns and to make meaning about them as a whole. And it'll, that may become a little more clear. And absolutely, these slides are available to you. So the next uh, slide shows you uh, an example of strengths from one organization. So one organization talked about that they are very competent. The staff are competent at their jobs and they work very well independently. They talked about how they all have really a positive attitude. They come with that. They're very strong about that. It helps them to be hopeful and they're empathic. They listen very well. They're open, they want to truly listen to understand. So what you would do with the model is you would write your strengths in the center and then go to the next slide. And then there are shadows. So for example, we can be highly competent and work really well individually. And one of the fallouts of that is we could feel very isolated or on an organizational perspective, there may be lack of cohesion, even fragmentation. We can have a very positive attitude that in fact covers up 
that we are unable or unwilling to express grief. And one of the things that's true about cumulative trauma is that there is grief. There is loss. The pandemic has brought loss. The other thing about a positive attitude is sometimes we will be conflict avoidant. Now, I will tell you, as someone who tends to come with a positive attitude, and that's one of the strengths that I bring, neither of these are my shadows. But I would say, personally, a shadow for me is that sometimes I struggle with, (laughs) I have had people say to me, well, you must just not understand if you're so happy right now, (laughs) or, um, you know, you must not have much depth. And so I'm frequently misunderstood, frankly, and I have to sort of stop and say, because I show you a positive attitude and I have energy, believe me, I will come alongside you. I, I feel grief and I am not conflict avoidant. That doesn't mean I go looking for conflict, but I will walk up to it. But I will just tell you that I do have to sometimes step back and say, am I really letting people see all of me? Do they understand that being positive doesn't mean that I don't feel pain? The group said as a group, they're empathic and that one of the things that happens for them is when they come together, there can be a lot of stress contagion. That when they come together, if someone's having a hard day, they don't feel like they can say, I'm full up. I can't listen right now. There's no permission to not listen. And we know that sometimes with with boundaries, we need to say, I simply can't, I don't have it today. I'm very willing to listen later or I can listen for this amount of time, Um, but we have to be able to hold boundaries. So I'm gonna pause and give you a minute to let me know if there are questions about what I've just shared with the strengths and shadows. or comments? I just would say that, that the strengths have a mirror. They, they, they mirror each, the strengths and shadows mirror each other in a way. They have- Okay. Um, yeah. Would you share what, you, what one of your strengths was? I did not share any of my strengths, but I, li- but I heard some listed that sounded like our um, organizational strength. Organizational. We'll talk about organizational trauma. One of the things that you all shared right at the beginning is that organizational trauma can be one piece of cumulative trauma, and that's accurate. I recognize that there is historical trauma that there is, can be family trauma, that there can be individual trauma. There can be the trauma of being with people we care about who have trauma. And there can be organizational trauma. So I'm going to introduce you again to a model and a framework for how to think about cumulative trauma. Okay, next slide. The types and sources of trauma are single devastating events is a type, ongoing wounding, empathic nature of our work and redemptive nature of our work. And I'll explain each of those. One of the things I'd like to point out is that trauma can impact an organization from the outside, a wounding against the organization. Trauma can also erupt within the organization. 
So in the case of single devastating events, these are events that we often hear about. A public shooting, for example, a suicide of a leader or a staff member. We will often hear about an event to the extent that it'll make the news, people will be creating practices for how to deal with that. An external single devastating event, like loss of funding from an outside source, severe weather destruction. My experience is that people hoped the pandemic would be a single devastating event or a short term ongoing wounding. And in fact, the pandemic has been ongoing wounding that has caused layers of pain for individuals, families, communities, and organizations. So when you look at this list, single devastating event, public shooting, loss of funding, severe weather destruction, suicide of a leader, I would also say death of a beloved staff member, abusive behavior of any kind, for example, a leader belittling staff in public, threatening uh, that staff will lose their jobs, any kind of violence or threat of violence or insider embezzlement, all of those can cause a major wound to an organization. Ongoing wounding from the outside is a threat, some kind of overt hostility directed at the organization, and again, the pandemic. So an example of that could be a church, a mosque, a temple that gets repeatedly defaced. It could be, we had an example of a, a family support organization in a rural area that supported a young woman, a 14 year old who was sexually assaulted by an older man. And the older man's parents owned the only grocery store in town. And the staff at that agency were no longer welcome to shop at the grocery store. So they had to travel for 30 miles to buy groceries. That was an ongoing hostility directed at them. Ongoing wounding inside, again, if there's any kind of ongoing abusive leadership practices. And unfortunately, I have worked with staff teams where they suffered under leaders who would threaten them with losing their jobs, who would tell them how poorly they were doing, who belittled them that kind of harassment. And unfortunately, even in our fields, we have sexual violence by people within the organization who have power or, or more power against others. The empathic nature of the work I referred to very early on when I said that Pat, Vivian and I were looking at that the very nature of the work that we do working with people in crisis, working with people in trauma, that we can experience secondary trauma, compassion, fatigue, vicarious trauma, and we can bring that into our organizations. We have to be constantly aware and awake to the needs of our staff and whether they in fact need to be addressing secondary trauma. Finally, the redemptive nature of the work comes to us out of the civil rights work of the 60s, where the leaders talked about that they had very high goals for themselves. They really wanted to redeem society and really and truly have civil rights. And they could see that where we were as a society and where they wanted to be were vastly different places. And that there was a struggle and a tension between where we were and where they wanted to be. 
And sometimes that tension was too hard to hold. And they would turn on one another. And I've seen this in sexual assault and domestic violence organizations and in other nonprofit organizations that are working against oppression. We take on that guilt and depression and we say, you're not working hard enough to battle oppression or you're, you're not committed enough or maybe I'm not committed enough. It's, it's a very tough kind of wounding that we can do to ourselves. And I'm going to pause and I'm gonna ask you to do a piece of writing. I'd like you to look at this list or to hear what you heard out of what I said. And I'd like you to write, just free write for about three minutes just what's in your gut, what's in your mind, what memories it brings up, just to download it so that it's out on the paper. You may or may not share it, but it's to get it out of your system and out onto paper. So if you would please take three minutes. What I'm asking you to do is a form of reflective practice. It's, it, um, when we reflect on our practice and we think about it a little more deeply away from the time that it happened, again, we help ourselves to learn something from it. And I don't ask you to do this because I want to anchor the trauma. I ask you to do this to understand that it's really helpful for our bodies to not carry all of that information. The information has emotional load to it. And being able to write some of it out helps us to put it in a place that tells our minds it's okay, we've got it out here, it's not going anywhere. We don't have to keep thinking about it over and over and over. I'm wondering if there's any piece of this, either what you wrote or what you heard that you'd like to comment about. Would anyone like to comment? This slide shows you the impacts of trauma on the left and ways to create healing on the right. So when I think about cumulative trauma, I think about how the trauma impacts get layered, that isolation increases, that functioning becomes that much more overwhelmed, 
that people feel vulnerable and they can get to feeling really helpless and even hopeless. That the stress and anxiety contagion starts to feel normal, like a way of life. And that there is lasting psychic and cultural impact. So the example that was just shared with us about a shooting, a couple of shootings, and the fact that resources were set up for staff to use is a way to address lasting psychic and cultural impact. Another example is what happened with Planned Parenthood in Boston. Years ago, Planned Parenthood was a couple of small centers in Boston, in the city of Boston, and a man walked into a couple of them and started shooting. And he did kill um, a person, he wounded people. And the community came together around Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood raised a lot of money and they built a building right on Harvard Avenue. That building has security that would rival Fort Knox. It's amazing, the security in it. And so the lasting impact of that is that the staff know when they go to work, they're safe. They also know the flip of that or the mirror of that, as was said earlier, is that they know they have to have that kind of security to be safe. And even today, so many years after all of that has happened, there are staff who talk about feeling like they armor up when they go to work. It's that kind of lasting impact in the organizational culture. So we know that for healing, we want to keep building connections. We want to help people build bridges from where they are to where they want to be. We want them to build connections with other people. We want to pause. One of the things that happens in our work, any crisis work actually, even any counseling work, is that we see people before us and they are our priority, very appropriately so. However, we need to pause so that we can also help them to pause. And I'll ask you to just pause right now and take a deep breath. Breathe out and take a deep breath in and out. A simple pause helps our body to calm down a little bit. It helps our mind to calm down. Again, Part of cumulative trauma impact is that our whole being speeds up. In fact, our own beings, as well as organizational cultures, can become hypervigilant. So we need to keep helping us, ourselves and our cultures, to slow down, to give support to affirm that right now in this moment, we are all right. We are not vulnerable and helpless. We are safe right now. We strengthen our boundaries and containment so that we don't have just ongoing stress and anxiety contagion. And we come together and engage in meaning making. So even knowing that there's lasting psychic and cultural impact, the more we can come together and say, so what does that mean for us? The fact that we walk in here every day and we have such high security, let's take a moment, let's pause, let's breathe, let's recognize that we're safe where we are. And let's engage in meaning making, which means how do we make meaning of the work we do? How do we talk about that? How is that connected for us? The next slide, please. When trauma has occurred, I 
talk with leaders about what happened. So what was the source of the trauma? The, this, these are the first two questions are also what I asked when we were talking through that last example. So the source of that trauma was that there were shootings, right? What's the source? What was done that was helpful and promoted healing? A program was started and, and it's been supported with people being staff in that program. I might also ask what did not help or what made the situation worse? Because sometimes that's also true that, that um, <laughs> I've had several leaders tell me that they know that they took too long before they addressed trauma in their organization, that they kept hoping that it would just resolve itself. I've heard that. I hoped it would resolve itself. I've heard, well, I thought that if this person left, that everything would be okay. I've heard, well, once we talked about it once, I, I figured, you know, we could just get on with business. We want to stay focused on our work. So we have to keep coming back to the pause. The pause helps us to understand if really we are ready to move on. It's not that we don't keep doing our work. We do. However, we don't keep saying to everyone, everything's fine, everything's fine, business as usual, we say, okay, pause, how are you today? Pause, breathe. Do we need to take time again? So let me give you an example of a trauma that could happen to, to any staff team. It doesn't even have to do with organizational trauma. I was part of the Muckleshoot Tribal College when one of our young staff who was pregnant died suddenly. People were just so grief stricken. It was a very hard time and it was hard to show up for the students in the way that we needed to. And it impacted the whole community, the whole tribal community. So we came together as a staff at the college and it was voluntary. So about, I would say three fourths of the folks came together and we just checked in with how we were doing and we told stories about her and we wrote cards to her family. And then we set up a table that had a picture of her. It had some sacred cedar on the table. It had a little book where people could write notes that we then gave the book to her mother. And then we had her favorite food on the table, which were Cheetos. And we left that table up for a month. And it wasn't like right in the middle of the lobby and everybody had to see it. It was down the hall a little bit, but it was something that was a reminder that we were all healing still, that she was still in our hearts and that we wanted to promote healing with each other. So I'll pause again and just say, are there comments or do people have other examples they'd like to share? I can give another example. <laughs> I was okay. I was thinking about my prior job was with the school system, and um, anytime we would have like a student a student suicide, we would bring in extra support staff for that day or the next few days to cover for any
All right, we're going to talk about resilience. Let's go on. Let's go to the next one. One of the things that we have just now been talking about is collective meaning making. So for example, the, the comment that Lizette made about um, what happens when it's so hard for the officers when one of their own kills him or herself and, and how they deal with that. And unfortunately, too often when there's that kind of trauma, people get left on their own. And to be able to come together, as I shared with the example from the tribal college, one of the things that I did with a group of firefighters and EMTs, there were a couple of us who did a debrief with them that was slightly different than what they usually do. They had to respond to two buses that collided and one was full of college students. And it was, I, I'm just not even gonna describe it. It was really terrible. Okay, thank you. And so, so one of the things that, um, that we did was make voluntary two different times that they could come together and talk about their experience. And, and one of the things that we shared with them was how important it was for us as the whole community that they had done what they did, that it was so important to us and we were so grateful to them. And sometimes that's important for our collective meaning making, to be able to say to one another to, and to have an outside source as well, say to our staff, we're so grateful for your work. Thank you very much. We know this takes a toll on you. Thank you for what you do we would like to be part of your collective meaning making as well. Let's go on please to the next slide. When we're building resilience, we need to be relentlessly optimistic. We keep strengthening whatever positive connections there are and we build them if we don't have them. Uh, and I have worked with organizations where leadership has said to me, unfortunately, under our last leader, our connections in the community were severed. They are not positive. So sometimes we have to start there. We need to build those connections. But in all of that, we have to commit to our own care and support for one another. And so I ask you, what have you done in the last couple of weeks to show support, to show care to a coworker? One of the ways to do that is to engage in gratitude, to simply say to someone, I'm grateful for your work. Perhaps you've sent them a birthday card. Perhaps you've sent an email that said, I know you've had a tough couple of weeks. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, Perhaps you've been able to have coffee together. Supporting one another, showing care is so critical to our own well being. That's part of what the research is showing. Being able to have gratitude contributes to our own well being. So let's go on. We're going to actually do some of this. We're going to now do some practices. This slide is simply here for your information. Uh, next slide, please. Let's do some reflective practice together. All right, next slide. So why am I saying reflective practice when we're talking about cumulative trauma? I say reflective practice because this is a way to strengthen. This is a way to heal. This is a way to build resilience. Reflective practices are actually strategies that help us to pause, that help us to address challenges while we are having a balanced approach, a non 
anxious presence. We want to be able to contribute from a healthy place, not from a place full of anxiety and stress that then contributes to anxiety contagion or stress contagion. We want to engage in self-care and team care. And we want to be able to model that as individuals. And we want to be able to lead that in a way that involves the collective and the whole organization. So let's talk about what are these strategies. Let's practice a bit. Next slide, please. For those of you who are interested in the research behind reflective practice, I'd like to introduce you to a couple um, to three models. So first of all, Dewey long-term reflection on practice, right? Dewey's research is probably referred to the most in uh, across the board. He was one of the first who said, we have some kind of a stimulus, something happens. I mean, Sometimes it's as serious as a shooting. Sometimes it's as serious as assault. We have some kind of an action that happens that we then decide how we're going to act. What are we going to do in response? Then we need to reflect. How was our action received? Did what we do actually address the trauma? Did it lessen the impact of the trauma? Or did it exacerbate the trauma? Did it make things worse? Okay, let's think then what we'll do different next time. So that cycle of practice goes back to Dewey's work. Then along comes Ron Heifetz. And Heifetz said, Let's look at leadership without easy answers. That was one of his first books. And he talks about the fact that while we're on the dance floor, while we're engaged in the practices, while we're part of the organizational patterns, we can see from our position on the dance floor what people are doing. However, we have to walk up the stairs or take the elevator up to the balcony to be able to look over the railing and down on the dancers to see the patterns. That sometimes instead of engaging in the patterns, we need to back up. It's his way of talking about reflecting on our practice, that we back up, we take a view that looks down at the patterns themselves. So he would talk about Pat's and my strengths and shadows model as going to the balcony. That we've stepped back a little bit to look at what are the patterns and do we want to address some of what's in the shadows? Are we comfortable with what's in the shadows? And we don't want to change that. I I've had some leaders say to me, Yes, we have high commitment to the mission. That's a strength. Yes, the team over functions. That's a shadow. You know what? That's a shadow that I expect. That's not one we're going to address. However, the fact that this team is conflict avoidant, that's a pattern I want to address. I've had other leaders say to me, commitment to the mission resulting in over functioning that's the pattern I want to address. I want to talk about what boundaries need to be in place so people are operating from a place that's healthy for them. But we have to go to the balcony. We have to in some have some way of even seeing the patterns to be able to address them. And then Brene Brown talks about increasing our boundaries of vulnerability, then we need to increase our capacity. 
we have such high capacity for empathy, for compassion. And we need to also have our boundaries around that. So she calls for us to reflect on our practice and to look at, are we operating in a way that is healthy? Are we modeling that for other staff? Are we modeling that for the people with whom we're working? Next slide, please. So this is the first strategy I would like to introduce you to. This strategy is called box breathing. We're going to do this together. And what we'll do is we'll breathe into the count of four. We'll hold for the count of four. We'll breathe out for the count of four and we'll hold for the count of four. And we'll do it twice. And I will in fact count you through it. So to start with box breathing, get comfortable where you are. You might be standing, you might be sitting, you might be lying down, I don't know. Get comfortable, actually wiggle back and forth a little bit, roll your shoulders back a little bit, exhale deeply, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe normally. Now your body knows what's coming, raise your left shoulder up, high, and then let it fall. Raise your right shoulder up high and let it fall. Breathe out deeply and breathe in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Breathe out. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, and breathe normally. One of the things about reflective practice is that it's so important to be able to incorporate it in something that we already do. So if you already have a staff meeting, you can do box breathing at the beginning or the end. It helps for people to have more oxygen. It helps us to be more creative in our thinking. It helps us to pause. It's a way of saying we're all going to pause without saying pause. Instead, we say, let's breathe together. I also use breathing when I realize there's tension in the room. I just breathe for the room. I don't even have to say anything to anyone else. I'll just breathe so that I am not holding anxiety in my body. And I can bring what I want to bring forward in a way that's not anxious. Would anyone like to comment on how it felt to breathe? I'll just say that, um, can you guys hear me? Yes. The, the second strategy is writing. And what I've done is to put five prompts. When do you feel happiest? To write about five people, places, and things for which you are grateful, essentially to make a gratitude list. To consider ways that you've grown in the past year, to think about who inspires you, and to write about a book, movie, or song that made an impact on you. And just so you know, if you want to find other prompts, you can actually Google prompts for reflective writing, and you can get hundreds of them 
I have found that these are helpful because I generally go to appreciation. Appreciative inquiry says that any time we ask a question or ask people to take an action, we are in fact doing an intervention. And that our brains operate in such a way that we tend to anchor the hard things, the traumas, the pain, more than we will anchor the happiness, the joy. And so appreciative inquiry says you're not avoiding the hard things when you ask about things that are strengths or things that bring people happiness or inspiration. People will still think about those other things. They can raise them to you. However, you help them to anchor some of the positive, some of the strengths in their lives when you ask about them. So again, I will ask you, I'm only gonna give you like three minutes, but I'll ask you to choose one of these prompts and write about it. When do you feel happiest to make a gratitude list, to think about ways you've grown, to, to think about who inspires you and why, or perhaps a book, movie, or song that made an impact on you? Um, so please choose one and we'll be quiet for just a couple of minutes. There's a strategy called appreciative storytelling. With appreciative storytelling, I would, uh, let's see, I can give you an example. So I would sit with one of you and we would each have a turn to tell a story. And let's just say that you start and you know that you're going to tell a story for anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 minutes. So you want to pick a story that you really, um, that, that made your day, that made it just, you were at the top of your game. It's a time when you loved your work or you were so excited about your family or you want people to share something that is very appreciative and really has feeling for them. So you share your story 
And the only thing that I would do is if you pause, I might ask you a question about it, or I might say, tell me more about that. When you're done, I say back to you, this is what I heard, the active listening that really lifts up the highlights of your story. Then we change and I share my story and you would only ask me questions or make comments to further my understanding and deepening of my own story. So it's a way of taking the writing and making it oral, right? You can, instead of writing, you can do the appreciative storytelling. The work comes from David Cooper Ryder and uh, Deborah Whitney out of Case Western University. They really started all of the appreciative inquiry research. And out of that has come so much, especially um, a lot of the brain research around how our, what our brains hold and what we need to further to strengthen our resilience. So I'll ask you, uh, would anyone like to share any, uh, or even just which prompt you chose? To the next slide. The third strategy is a body scan. And I'm actually going to take you through a visualization for relaxation. And I'm going to use this as the model to do that. So I'll ask you to get comfortable. This will take about five minutes. So get comfortable. Take a few deep breaths in and out. Bring your awareness to your feet. Breathe and imagine you're breathing into your feet, releasing any tension in your feet and relaxing more deeply. You may close your eyes. Bring your attention now to your calves and let the muscles in your calves relax. Now focus on your thighs and all the way up to your hips and breathe into your hips, giving yourself room and letting your body relax. Breathe into your pelvis. Breathe in deep and out. And breathe into the small of your back. And imagine the muscles in your back become long and relaxed. Breathe into your torso. Breathing wide and allowing your ribs to expand. As you breathe in and out, imagine that you're breathing into the rings of a tree trunk, mm -hmm. filling yourself with air. And swallow to open your throat and breathe into your jaw and into your face. Let your eyes soften and let the muscles in your face relax. 
And now starting at the top of your head, slowly scan down your body, down your face, down your neck, breathing down your shoulders, down your arms, down your back, down through your heart, through your stomach, down into your hips, down your legs, down your feet, Letting your energy be all the way down into the earth. And now breathe in any place that there might be tension in your body. Just give it a little breath and let it be. And now give yourself gratitude for breathing and for this session, for taking the time for yourself and to learn. Wiggle your fingers and toes. Open your eyes. And would anyone like to share what that was like? It's there are apps that you can use for breathing and for meditation or visualization or relaxation. One is called Balance, and the other app is called Insight, I-N-S-I-G-H-T, Insight Timer. They are, they are really helpful. I've had a number of people tell me that they listen to them as they go to sleep that they listen to them as a way of pausing during the day. So I highly recommend it. Christina says she agrees that it was really good. Okay. And the last slide. I thank you all for taking the time today. It was lovely to be able to be with you. I am available by email and the, um, the website there is my website and there are resources on the website as well. And thank you so much for attending today. Oh, thanks everybody.